it's so nice to see um, all of you. Um, I see some people returning, um, which is great, and some new faces, which is also awesome. I'm Susie Spickle, the Community Programs Director and one of the naturalists for the Harris Center, and um, I'm just kind of here because I love nature mysteries. I love learning from my colleagues who are here tonight and I love the questions that um, many of you send in. So I'm going to go around. I'm going to have the experts or on our panel kind of introduce themselves and I might as well start with Miles since he kind of runs the show. So Miles. Hello everybody. I'm Miles. I'm the office manager at the Harris Center. I try and make all the technical aspects work smoothly uh, and an amateur bird watcher as well. So Thanks, Miles. That's awesome. Um, tonight, we're really, really excited. We have, um, usually we have people representing different aspects of the natural world, and our bird people um, have flown the coop. So we had to go afield and find an excellent um, birder to be here this evening, and it's really my pleasure to have Chad introduce himself. Chad, tell us about yourself. Hi, Susie. Um, thanks for having me, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, so for all of you who don't know me or never met me, my name is Chad Whitco, and I'm currently in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, I am an outreach biologist for National Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative. Uh, and more locally uh, to the Monadnock region, I'm also the co-founder of the Antioch Bird Club, which some of you may have interacted with in the past. So Great. super happy to be here. We're so happy to have you, and we met Chad because he was um, the raptor biologist up on Pacman Adnock uh, a couple of years ago and did such a great job, and it's so nice to stay connected with him and see him um, taking off in directions, and birding directions. So exciting. So let's see, we also have Brett. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Hey, everyone. I am Brett Thielen. I'm the science director at the Harris Center and at Ask a Naturalist, I tend to answer questions about reptiles and amphibians. Great, thank you, Brett. And how about Jenna? Hi, everybody, I'm Jenna, and I am a teacher naturalist at the Hera Center, and I'm also trained in entomology, so I tend to answer insect-related questions. Very exciting. Whenever Jenna gets a question to answer, I'm always just blown away by the insect world. Whoa. Um, Margaret, you don't, I don't usually have you introduce yourself, but Margaret does something really important for the Harris Center. So Margaret, tell us about yourself. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to be here and see all of you. I'm Margaret Baker, and I do all the print communications for the Harris Center. So anything you get in the mail is something I've uh, designed and usually in collaboration with everyone on the staff, especially Brett and Lisa and uh, Jeremy sometimes, whatever. It's fun. It. Margaret, think. yeah, Margaret makes us look really beautiful, and we're always so grateful to her wonderful it's not artist hard to do. eyes. Thanks, Susie. You're welcome. Hey, Jeremy, you're here. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Well, he might be getting a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the director at the Harris Center, and I, I found out recently I, I may not have any questions tonight, so I'm just going to relax and listen to uh, people's answers, which is always fun. Great. I, don't, I think that's it. Did I miss anybody, Miles? I'm looking. John's not here yet. We're expecting John Benjamin um, to join us. He's our mushroom person and generally an all around pretty fabulous naturalist. Um, but so without any further ado, let's get started, Miles. What have we got today? Very exciting. All right, so I'm gonna read this. It says, imagine my surprise when I came upon this amazing sight while hiking in the woods. I thought surely he, she was injured, but she flew up to a low branch when I started talking to her. Is this a young owlet? And is this behavior normal? And this question comes from Laura. And I'm so excited because Chad, this is your question. You're the bird guy. What do you think? Well, I will say that when it comes to determining uh, behaviors in animals, sometimes it, it is kind of difficult to determine that just from a photo alone. Um, it's a capture in time that doesn't always tell the full story. Um, for me, this bird looks no different than any adult barred owl that I have seen before. Uh, so nothing here is screaming to me that it is a young bird. Um, 
or a bird of this year. I've actually never seen this behavior in the wild myself uh, with barred owls. Um, but if I were to take a guess, there's a few potential options I think this could be. Um, the first could be that raptors, sometimes when they have prey, they will shield uh, their prey item uh, by putting out their wings, uh, covering it so other potential predators um, might not see it or want to take it from them. This, you see this commonly with red-tailed hawks in fields at times. Um, it also, looking at the, the ground, you know, the bird could have been either sunbathing or dust bathing itself, uh, which is something that, you know, all birds need to do, uh, the dust bathing part, you know. A lot of birds will dust bathe in lieu of regular bathing, and it helps them get parasites out of their feathers. Um, another behavior that, you know, I don't know that barred owls do, but just in case others see this behavior in other species, is some birds will do a thing uh, called anting, um, Northern flickers are really famous for this, and they'll actively lay down near ant mounds um, and let the ants crawl over them. And um, sometimes they'll actually grab the ants and squish them into their feathers because of the acid that the ants have uh, is a good way of getting rid of parasites. Wow, wait, Chad, go back, back up for a minute. Are you saying that some birds um, will, will let ants on their body and then kind of squeeze out the acid of the ant to help them with the parasites? Yeah, or, or sometimes just let the ants actively crawl through and, you know, get rid of some of the parasites. Um, the bird around here that I think of most regularly doing that are, are flickers, and I've seen them doing that a few times. Wow, that was just so amazing. Uh, again, this is one of the things that I love about Ask a Naturalist is um, you can learn something new every time. And even though I, I, I'm a naturalist myself and I love nature, I am so, I love my colleagues because they know things that I don't know and it's exciting. So Chad, thank you so much. So we're not quite sure what this owl was up to, but some possibilities were really given out and it's so interesting. All right. Um, has John arrived? John Benjamin, are you out in the audience? I don't see him, so I'll take this one. Luckily for me, I happen to know this puffball. Um, and, and we have a poll. We have a poll. Oh, shoot. Le okay, well, here's a puffball. This is indeed a puffball. It's a type of a fungus, and Russ is right. Um, and it's actually my favorite puffball. It's the first mushroom I learned when I took my mycology course with Dr. Fungi himself, Dr. Rick Vanderpool, Dr. Mushroom. Um, this is the gem studded puffball, and um, it's a beautiful, creamy white mush puffball mushroom or fungus that grows and when you see it um and you pick it up and it's young it has these little studs on it so the gem studded it's sort of like little projections all over it. and this one's quite old so it's sort of splintered and kind of gotten it's beginning to crack um, but when it's young it's covered with these small little projections that are all over it and that's where it gets its name as gem studded puffball and it is indeed edible and I have eaten it at my friend's house when he used to have a wild edibles party um, this was by far one of the better things that we would eat <laughs> at those parties so I'm a big fan of the gem studded puffball but I would just caution you um, it can be confusing Fused with some other puffballs that aren't as edible. Um, not so much the pigskin puffball, but you wouldn't want to eat that one because you would end up very ill. Um, and my policy would be um, don't eat it unless you are with someone who can, who you really trust, who can accurately identify any wild mushroom. Well, that is my basic policy. And even even if you are with somebody who does, I would double check it. Sometimes certain mushrooms can, if you eat them and they are edible and you drink alcohol, the alcohol can release a toxin from the mushroom or you as an individual can have a reaction to the mushroom. So I'm always very cautious with um, mushrooms. It's easy for me since I'm not a huge mushroom fan. So that's my piece on the gem studded puffball. Let's see what's next. This is the question. We observed a feathery vine draped over a sumac plant and wondered if you could tell us what it is. Brett, what the heck is that thing? So I didn't know what this was either, but thankfully John Benjamin did. And, and then I was able to look up a little bit about it. This is a vine that is called Virgin's Bower. 
It's also sometimes called old, ma old man's beard, which is also something we associate with a lichen, and devil's darning needles, which I think is a great name. Um, you oft it's often noticed in the fall, so it's appropriate timing um, because these you can see those kind of feathery, uh, those feathery um, projections are actually, um, they're fruits, and, but they're very noticeable at that time when they're fruiting. And it is a native plant, although there is an invasive that has a similar appearance with slightly different leaves. Um, the leaves are, of this plant are toxic and are primarily avoided by mammals, but um, I guess a lot of insects still like to, be, still like to eat them. And that's about all I know, and I know about it courtesy of Mary Holland and her Naturally Curious book, which if you have a natural history question is an incredible resource because it's um, comprehensive and goes throughout the year. So I was able to look this up and this was right around this, the time for now. So anytime you have a, a I have a question about something I see, I often look in that book for the right, for the time of the year and it's often there. So yeah, Brett, that's such a great shout out for that book. If you are looking to um, up your naturalist, um, Brett's showing you this. It's Naturally Curious Day by Day by Mary Holland. She's out of Vermont and she has also a really great um, blog and a website that you can follow too. And it's really, she just does a fabulous job. It's filled with her own photographs primarily and this incredible amount of knowledge that she has. I think it's interesting that this plant has um, three common names that are really kind of, they're very evocative, but they're not related. Like what? Devil's darning needles, yep. vir virgin bower, and old man's beard. I mean, it's like kind of crazy that this is describing all the same plant. So that's why common names aren't always that helpful. Really great. All right, let's see what's next. Aha, this is always my upright my alley. We found this scat on a driveway through a wetland forest in the north part of Keene. There's a cornfield nearby. A seven inch ruler is included for scale. What can you tell us about it? Wow, well, first of all, that's a lot of scat. That is an animal that has really, really been eating and it's been eating a lot of kind of roughage and you can see um, in the scat those little seeds and I don't know enough about my plants to know exactly what plant that is, but it's filled with these little seeds and the sheer kind of quantity and size of it brings to mind one animal in particular and that is the, the bear. Um, you can also see another reason that I'm going for bear is that the scat is, um, it's not twisty. It's sort of in what we call pugs or segments, and the segments are kind of blunted. And the, that blunted shape, um, not to get too graphic around dinner time, but it's, you know, it's kind of like how we go to the bathroom. It's very similar to the omnivore diet of the bear. And so this is just a bear that's really busy eating right now. And it should be, should be eating a lot. Um, it's, I got what we call hyperphagia, which I myself have at this time of the year, where I just want to eat and eat and eat. And that's triggered, the bear has been having this need to pack on as much food as it can um, and eat huge quantities because it's trying to stock up enough fat to make it through the winter. Um, and it's triggered by once the daylight begins to decrease and the night begins to extend, it triggers a hormone in the bear's pituitary gland and that hormone gives it a insatiable appetite. And if my friend Eric Aldrich was here, he would just describe a bear as a, a nose attached to a stomach. Um, and they just busy, busy, busy eating. Um, so this is some bear scat. Um, and when you gotta go, you gotta go, even if it's on a driveway in Keene. And Susie, I'm pretty sure that's corn in the scat. Is it, is it really the little seeds inside corn? It looks like yellow corn, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, and Ruth Benedict, she just you just asked if it triggers the same thing in humans. And yes, um, the the um, hormone that it triggers in humans and and ma other mammals is melatonin, and um, it increases the melatonin, which also increases your appetite and your your desire to get sleepy. And so as the daylight, as the night, it's actually as the night lengthens, the melatonin increases. And you know it's not um, it's not a surprise that this is the time of the year when we have a lot of harvest and we also see 
extra hungry and we have lots of holidays that involve eating large amounts of food. So um, we're, when it comes down to it, we're mammals too. And, and um, to think that we are not affected by that would be silly. So let's move on to the next question. Oh, I love this question. Lida asked this question. How can birds balance so very well on small moving branches in the wind and swaying feeders? What's the difference about their balance mechanism from humans? Just marveling at these hummingbirds on my jumping clothesline. Chad, how do they do it? Well, there's a few things. Um, you know, the question talks about how it's different than humans, but I'll mention a few things that are similar to us first. Uh, you know, the first thing is thinking about vision, you know, um, we have this thing that we call gaze stabilization. And, you know, if you're looking at a screen and you move your head back and forth, you know, what you're looking at tends to stay stable. You know, the image doesn't blur. You can move your head and still read what's on your screen. Uh, birds kind of do this to the next level, and, and they have a lot of special muscles in their neck that help them do that. Uh, if you think about pigeons walking or you think about a kingfisher on a perch, or a kestrel in flight, you'll see that their heads are kind of staying stable around their body. That's helping them uh, balance their, their head on some level. Um, they also have, you know, organs inside their inner ears, similar to us. Um, they're are kind of like a gyroscope and help them stay balanced. Um, but that's kind of where some of the similarities end on some level. Um, being on a branch and moving wind is really difficult, but one of the things they have is special adaptations for the, the you know, the musculature and the tendons in their legs, that when their, you know, their, their knee joints and their ankle joints are compressed, it, it basically turns on this automatic system that clenches their feet. So as long as they're in a perch position, they won't let go. And this is how raptors, when they get prey, that motion of pouncing on it, you know, activates that and that enables their talons to squeeze in. The other thing that's really uh, interesting is that researchers are realizing that birds have kind of this hip localized balance um, that we didn't really know about before. Along the spine, there's these semicircular canals called the lumbro lumbrosacral uh, organs. And it's basically these little canals that are filled with fluid. They act like balances on a scale. And it helps the birds stay balanced in the lower portions of their body, kind of separate from the upper parts in their head. And so as that fluid moves around, it mechanically stimulates the nerve cells uh, that tell the bird, you know, where to adjust. And so they're able to make these micro adjustments uh, super quick. And, you know, that's why we can see them flitting branch to branch or you know, doing all these crazy things that, you know, we couldn't even imagine doing. Wow, that was so cool. I mean, just you had so much information in there. And I loved how you started off with comparing what, what was similar with us and birds, and then the amazing detail ad adaptation for, um, for the bird. That's so cool. And Miles, I recognize, is this a photograph your wife took? No? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to tell us about it? Where is that taken? Oh, right outside the window that I'm looking at. <laughs> she wow. a hummingbird feeder and has been watching them, you know, over the summer. Beautiful photograph. That's great. Thank you. I think we have another hummingbird question. So Chad, don't go anywhere. I had at least two hummingbird families on my deck feeder this summer. Loved watching them duke it out in the air. It seems that most of them left about September 6th, but there is one young one and one male still here. It seems late for them to be here. Do I need to worry about a baby left behind? It's the mother in me. Oh, Lida, that's sweet. I, I would worry too, but Chad, what's the deal? Yeah, there's absolutely no reason to worry. This is pretty natural. Um, for hummingbirds, you know, they're still around this time of year. Um, they are moving out through the month of September. Um, Ruby-throated hummingbirds will persist in some areas through this month, uh, even into October. Uh, I think research has shown that their timing of migration in the northern part of their range is timed pretty well with um, some jewelweed uh, blooming, um, which helps fuel them on their way. Um, Regarding the, the adult male being there and then the young still being there, um, typically males are the first ones to, to leave. Um, hummingbird males don't actually help with any of the rearing of young. So as soon as kind of they get things going and the female, you know, gets eggs on the way, the males kind of remove from the whole process. And so 
they kind of just head out first, typically. Um, this is typically followed by the adult females and then the immature first of the year birds uh, go on their own. And what's really amazing about this is that these birds, you know, they just kind of head out with this innate sense to go somewhere in a certain direction for a certain amount of time, having never done this journey before. Uh, and it's just one of the amazing things that, you know, birds show us in their migrations that's just really remarkable to, to fathom being just a few weeks old and knowing where to, to migrate to get down to the, the Gulf Coast and beyond. Wow, um, so there was a, an additional question. Um, people were wondering if they migrate in groups, kind of maybe like a hawk, or if they're singularly migrating, and and are they migrating at night? For which species? For hummingbirds. I don't know if they migrate at night, but I do know that they do migrate during the day. Um, you know, when I was working at Pac-Mananoc as the raptor uh, observer, you know, we would actually see ruby-throated hummingbirds migrating over the the crest of Pacman Adnock, um, just in these really quick, you know, bits. Um, and they're on their way, you know, just making their way south. And, and actually, as I'm answering this, uh, I'm realizing that they probably don't actually migrate at night for one main reason. And that's because during nighttime, hummingbirds go into a state of torpor. Um, it's kind of like bears going into hibernation during the wintertime. And, you know, they have to, you know, fuel up uh, quite regularly, you know, with their metabolisms. And so at nighttime, you know, they just kind of sit still and go into this metabolic state that allows them to lower their heart rate and get through to the next morning before feeding on nectar and insects and other things that help them go. Wow, so that was great. Thank you, Chad. Thanks again. That was, that was such great answers and, and um, even more answers based on new questions that came in. All right, let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love this. On June 7th, we saw a snapping turtle laying eggs. We included a photo of her. When she lays her eggs, are they all in one mass or distributed over a larger area? Brett, what do you got on this? So, um, they're basic, so few, snapping turtles may lay a few, they may start to do a few scrapes of false nests throughout the season, but for the most part, they lay one nest a year and it's in one spot. So they're not, they're laying all, their entire clutch in one cavity each, um, each summer, late spring and summer. Um, and they can have anywhere from 10 to more than 50, 60, 70 eggs, depending on the age and the size of the turtle. The, the um, older and bigger turtles obviously can um, deposit more eggs, but it's all in one, it's, it's in that one spot there, unless, um, often I, I have seen on the side of the road, you know, they get startled by a passing car or by just a human disturbance and they may, before they've started actually depositing eggs, they may abandon that effort and go back to the water and come back and try again or go to another s spot and try again. So um, if they actually saw this turtle um, depositing eggs, then that was, that turtle's uh, probably her one nest for the year. But if they didn't see it depositing eggs, it may have just been a, the start of a the start of a nest that wasn't completed. But I think there might be a second picture showing that it was in fact completed. Yes, let's move on to that. Let's see it. So this is the second part of this question. During the summer, the nest area remained undisturbed. When we checked at the end of August, we saw a small hole in the nest area. When we returned on sep September 4th, the hole had been enlarged to what you can see here in the picture we have sent, and there was fresh dirt at the entrance. What can you tell us about what happened, Sue? So Brett, what happened here? Did the turtles make it out or did somebody eat them? That's a good question and I I don't know exactly. I can't I can't um I can't confirm from this picture, but I can I can say a few things that um we had Phil Brown and I led a um an outing at the end of August to watch for nighthawks who were migrating and on our way back and Kim who I think is here tonight was with us she saw a baby snapping turtle on the rail trail near Powder Mill Pond and when we looked closer we saw that what it, there was more than one and that they were actively hatching out of their nest in that moment which was a really cool I have never seen that before I've seen lots of hatchling turtles after they've made their way from the nest but I've never actually seen them leaving the nest and when we looked at that nest there was a there was a hole like um, what Sue described on maybe on September 4th, um, but there wasn't a lot of dirt around that hole. It was really just a, a small enough hole for one hatchling turtle to get through, which are, you know, a little bit bigger than a quarter. Um, and one, one at a time 
were leaving and we could see some of the heads peeking out of the ones that hadn't left yet. So that first time when Sue came back and saw the hole there, I think that was probably the beginning of the hatching out. Um, I'm guessing that the, this, this excavation, I don't think that that is the turtles who did that. I think that's probably um, after the fact a predator who was attracted by the scent or movement of the turtles and came um, and dug around to see if there were any left in there that could be eaten. And there, there's been some studies that looked at um, nest predation for snapping turtles. Something between 90 and 95 percent of all nests get predated. So the fact that they even make it to hatch is really quite miraculous. Um, the vast majority of those get predated within a few days of the eggs being laid, but then there's this second wave that happens within a, um, a few days prior to and around hatch. Um, and what was found in this, these, this, some of these studies that looked at this is that that first wave of the eggs is typically raccoons who are doing the, the um, predating. And when we get towards the end of the season here, it's foxes. Um, maybe just something about this, the smell or the um, sound even possibly of, of the, the turtle starting to move from underground. So I, I'd wager, I guess, that at least some of these turtles made it out, but maybe some of them were intercepted um, on their way. Wow. And then Miles had, a, someone had a question yeah, about whether they hatch at night. Uh, that's a really good question. I, I looked into that and I, my first, um, I've seen some things, I, I read something that David Carroll wrote about spotted turtles hatching in the morning, and my guess was that it was a daytime thing. But I, I, this year I have seen, we saw that one nest that was hatching out just before dark. And I also have seen um, other hatchling turtles on walks I've taken at the end of the day. So I don't think it's necessarily nighttime or overnight, but maybe the edges of the day, the twilight times or, or coming on to that. Oh, I liked how you described that, Brett, the twilight times for turtle hatching. Very, very beautiful. And it's a miracle that any baby turtle makes it um, to adulthood. And that's all the more reason to slow down when you're driving um, during turtle laying season, turtle egg laying season and um, hatching season. So yeah, I, I um, would definitely say um, it's very, it's heartbreaking this year, um, every year, every August and September, I see dead um, hatchling snapping turtles along roads near water. And it's yeah. like Susie said, they made it so far, they were so close, you know, to getting to the water. So it's a really good time of year to slow down. And Ruth had one more follow-up question about what percentage of nests hatch in spring. Um, and yes, yeah, so some do over winter. So in our neck of the woods, August and September is a time when a lot of these nests hatch. And then some nests that might have been laid later in, this, in the spring and early summer, those turtles sometimes will overwinter in the nest and hatch out in April um, or, or even early May. But when we're out and about looking for migrating amphibians on rainy April nights, occasionally we also find hatchling turtles out and about. Um, but I don't know what percentage it is. I can't, I don't, I haven't seen anything about that. And um, I, I don't think it's, um, I think more of them are hatch, hatching just from anecdotal observation in August and September than in the spring, but some certainly do wait. And do skunks dig out eggs too? Yes. Although the egg, the vast majority of egg predation on snapping turtle nests anyway, and painted turtle nests is raccoons. But skunks won't turn, it, won't turn it down, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you, Brett. That was really interesting. And um, keep your eyes open for little hatchlings. These next couple of days are supposed to be pretty warm. And that's when they'll be um, hatching out if they haven't hatched out already. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, this is a poll oh. from a poll. Several, several years ago, um, they saw this hawk. What kind since it's winter? And say, I guess we should stop it. All right, Chad, what do we got? Sharp shinned hawk won the poll by 50, it's 52%. The next runner up was red tailed hawk and then juvenile bald eagle. So what, what do we have here? Um, I agree with the results of the poll. It, to me, it looks like a sharp shinned hawk. Um, I would be interested in seeing, you know, what the other was that maybe other people were considering. Uh, sharp shinned hawks actually, are part of a group of hawks called excipiters. These are our forest hawks. There's three species that are closely related. The northern goshawk is the largest and doesn't 
necessarily look like the other two for the most part, um, but Sharpshin and Cooper's hawks are, are very closely related and there's actually a lot of overlap with how they look that makes it difficult um, sometimes to identify them, not only when they're perched you know, or flying, but also just in photos as well. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the species. Uh, Sharpshins are the smallest. They're generally about the size of a blue jay or a little bit bigger. Cooper's hawks are about the size of a crow. Uh, and goshawks can be the size of a red-tailed, so they can be quite large. Um, but then there's dimorphism um, between the, uh, the different sexes. And, you know, typically females are larger than, than the males. And so a large female of the smaller species might overlap in size with the small male of the next size up. Um, but generally for a sharp shin hawk, you know, you're, you're looking at this bird, you, you can see it's kind of got a small bill. Uh, it's got a rounded head. Um, Cooper's hawks, tend, their heads tend to be a little blockier. Um, the eye is fairly large uh, if you look at the size of the head and it's kind of centrally located which kind of helps indicate the size of the bird overall, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, the tail is rather tattered, um, but sharp shins tend to have square based tails at the bottom uh, versus coopers, which are a little more rounded. Um, so these are a common, um, you know, forest species and species we see around our you know, residential areas. Um, a lot of them are migrating and, you know, you guys have had a lot of hawk programs and this is one of the main species we see up at Pac-Mananoc at the raptor platform. Um, but some of these birds will persist into the winter. So keep your eye out for all seasons with this species. That's great. Thank you. Very exciting. And I like the pole, Miles. That was fun. Even though you have to cut it out, I think it's a fun thing to keep. So we should take a pole. Keep the poles? Or keep, not, oh, we're keeping the poles. All right, let's see what we got. Ah, this was really interesting to me. Several of these starburst scrapes and mounds were present, present along um, the shore of the Connecticut River in wet sand. Something buried a pig nut in each. Who and why? This is from Pam. Um, yeah, this was interesting. I, I think I should take this. This is sort of a mammals in my thought. Um, and I can't confirm one way or the other exactly who buried it. I'd have to feel like I really needed, I would need to see the scrape marks, but um, my best guess is it's probably one of our scatter hoarders. So <laughs> a scatter hoarder is usually, um, in this case, I'm going to guess a rodent, maybe a squirrel, a gray squirrel, who is burying nuts for the winter. And what they're going to do is they're going to bury the nut and they're going to scrape over it. And we don't normally see the scrape because it's not usually in sand around here where we encounter somebody like a gray squirrel, but it's pulling over the um, sand over the nut to bury it. And they're scatter hoarding, they're spreading out their cache of nuts for the winter. And some animals are keep a larder where they put everything in one place, like a chipmunk keeps all of its acorns in its den under its pile of leaves, or even a beaver who's caching all those sticks right in front of the lodge. And that's like what we call a larder or a pantry. It's got all its food in one place. But then there's an animal like a squirrel, red squirrels and gray squirrels, and they're going to be burying their their food spread out over an area, which is kind of fascinating because they'll bury hundreds of nuts and their brain has to remember it. Um, so they're going to have to remember where they buried it. And they do, they've done a lot of studies on squirrels and they found out that it isn't really their sense of smell that leads them back to it because you have to remember they're searching for it in the winter where they really, it's really hard to smell stuff when it's frozen. So um, they are going to be having to really remember it. And there's been some studies that some of these scatter hoarders, their brain capacity increases for memorization in the fall um, so they can remember where they hid the things. And Jeremy asked a question. He said, won't well, the sand be frozen? How are they going to get at those nuts? And it's very possible that they might not be able to get at those nuts, but they have scatter hoarded so many nuts all around that um, it's okay if a few of them are unretrievable. And in fact, that's how 
um, rodents like squirrels are key in regeneration of forests and spreading the seeds out. And Jeremy, there was a question about what a pig nut is. I'm going to put you on the spot since you said you didn't have to answer any questions. Can you tell us pig nut, um, hickory nut, kind of what's the difference? What's a pig nut? I'm, I'm just guessing it's a pig, it's a, a nut from a pig nut hickory. So hickories are more common as we move south, but along the Connecticut River, you'll find pig nuts and shagbark hickory and much more commonly. So it's just a, it's a nut from a, a kind of tree. Very cool. And pig nuts are, they're a very common hickory as you move into Massachusetts and Connecticut. So perfect, right, or along the shore of the Connecticut River. One cool thing that I should mention about um, how squirrels bury their nuts, um, they're kind of tricky about it. Um, they don't, they'll um, kind of put their nut down and pretend to bury it and then pick it up and try and pretend to bury it in another spot and then finally bury it in a spot. And that's tricky behavior is so that anybody watching them isn't going to steal their nuts. So they've evolved sort of like a game of, I'm putting the nut here. Oh no, maybe I put the nut here. I'll put the nut here. And again, they have to remember, memorize where they put all those nuts. Um, and they're part of the brain that keeps track of that in squirrels. They have an enlarged area of their brain that's about mapping. So yeah, it's a shell game or a nut game. Ha, ha. Show them your nuts. Okay, let's keep going. What's next? Oh, okay, this is a poll. We're gonna listen, right? Or watch? Listen? It's a video. A video, we're, we're and watching. And then we'll take the poll after. Okay, it's a test, people. There's no sound. Can people see what's going on here? <laughs> there are little white dots on top of this beetle. Okay, so that's not the pattern of the beetle shell. No, no and they're moving. Oh, Jenna, yeah. no, no. <laughs> they're little critters. Oh my gosh. There we go. Okay, are the mites on the back of the beetle catching a ride on the beetle bus, babies of the beetle, parasites, or aliens <laughs> from another planet? <laughs> All right, let's see. Jenna. Yeah. What the, what's going on? Should well, first we, we got to see the results. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So people think parasites and they're wrong. It's the first one. They're catching a ride on the beetle bus. So I just have to, first of all, tell all of you guys, this was on my birthday and I was on a hike and um, my husband took that video and we, it was right on the side of the trail. And I was like, what the heck's going on? And we watched it for a while and there were a lot of mites on that beetle. Um, I mean, just probably at least 50, I would guess. So it turns out what's going on, and that's a carrion beetle. So the beetle is going to move those little mites from carrion location. It's like, imagine the carrion that the beetle's finding are the bus stops, right? And so the beetle wants to go find as many different places to lay its eggs, and the, the mites jump on, and they're carried to the next site because they're too small to travel on their own. So they get on the beetle bus and the beetle travels them to the next spot and then they get off the beetle bus and they eat the um, eggs and larvae of a carrion fly. So they're actually helping the beetle because that then is going to allow the beetle when it lays its eggs on the carrion to succeed because they have less competition. Get out. No kidding. No way. I was 100% convinced that those were parasites. Well, at first I was too, and I got home and I looked it up and I thought this is going to be really hard to find the answer to. And it was like, boom, when you start looking up mites on carrion beetle, you're just going to find like a treasure trove on the internet. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I like that it's carrion and it reminds me of carry on. <laughs> <laughs> like on your carry on. Bus, yeah. On the beetle bus. Bring your carry on on the be beetle bus to uh -huh. the next dead thing. Oh my gosh. Is this the Q and on everyone's talking about? Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> if only, Jeremy. Oh my goodness. We're great. getting out of control. This is a yeah. good, this is a, this is a really good Ask a Naturalist, I gotta say. Wow. <sighs> Phew. All Phew. right. Let's see what our next, what we got. Oh, okay. Found this web between two trunks along a trail in the White Mountains in mid-June. Couldn't find the weaver, but suspect it was a spider. Never saw this kind of web before. Does staff have any ideas? And this is from Trisha. Well, Trisha, I got to tell you, 
nobody on our staff really knew what this was. And we got it last month and we were like, uh oh. So we had to go afield and find a spider expert. And we are so lucky because there actually is a spider expert at Keene State College, Professor and Dr. Karen Cangiliosi. And she is studies spiders and her specialty is behavioral ecology of spiders. And I'm really excited to let you guys know that she's going to do a spider zoom on October 29th as part of our Halloween season. Um, it's called Spiders, Do You Dare? And she's going to be talking about spiders of New England and also kind of some of the more notorious spiders that we don't have around here like black widows and brown recluses and things like that. And um, I've been kind of um, conversing with Karen, so I sent her this picture. And what I'm going to share now is exactly what Karen says. She says, I'm going to read it. It's a funnel weaving or grass spider. Um, that made this. And this is typical in the autumn that you would see this. It is actually more than one web. It's multiple webs. And the older web is at the bottom. And you can kind of see that it's kind of falling apart at the bottom. And what happens is they'll build that they'll build that web between these two trees. And then as it kind of falls apart, they'll add to it and add to it and add to it. And at the very top, um, that's the newest part of this funnel weaver or grass spider. And what's also really interesting is that um, it's designed on the sides, we can't really see them, but on the sides of the web, or sometimes in the middle, depending on the species, there's sort of a funnel or a kind of a, a hole that the spider lives in. And the spider's in there, and that big sticky stuff on top that goes across, that's the barrier silk. So a, a little insect is flying along, it hits the barrier, it falls down into the web, and as soon as the web is shaking and triggered, the funnel spider comes up out of its funnel and investigates, is this something I want to eat? And if it is, it quick, it's very fast, it happens very fast, it quickly injects it with its venom, um, which sort of begins to liquefy the inside of the spider. This is why we're having it around Halloween, her spider talk. And, um, and that's what happens. And she said, this is the time of the year where you will see this because this might be a whole season's worth of spider, of this one funnel weaver spider's nest webs going up the tree. And so, especially in the autumn when we have, um, kind of cool mornings and there might be dew, you can see the dew kind of piling on it too. And so it makes it stand out. And so that's from um, Karen, who I hope many of you will turn out to hear on October 29th from 5.30 to 6.30. I think it's going to be really exciting. And don't be scared because you can always close your eyes if you have spider fear. So, all right, that's the spider news. Oh, look at this. This is from Betsy and she she's wondering this and I've been wondering this too. Are dragonfly and damselfly numbers down as are all insects? So yeah, um, Jenna, what's the scoop on insects? Well, um, this numbers. is interesting. I did a bunch of reading about this and interestingly, we don't have a lot of local research on the dragonfly and damselfly numbers in New England that I found. Um, but I do know that the migratory species of dragonflies, which there are about five of them from the Northeast, they are, um, there is data showing that they are declining, which makes sense only sadly because we're losing a lot of natural habitats and there's pollution. And the thing to remember about dragonflies is that they have both a terrestrial part of their life cycle and an aquatic part of their life cycle. So they'll be affected by any kind of disruption in either habitat. So, um, this particular situation in New England, if it's a local species, like a like sort of in your backyard pond or at the Harris Center, somewhere local that's protected and cared for, I would imagine that those species are doing better than those species that travel far and wide because um, they're gonna be affected on a much larger scale by things that happen. I know that there was a lot of data out of the UK about loss of habitat and water quality issues affecting the dragonflies and damselflies and also out of Mexico. So both of those places had a lot of data about declines in these um, different, these two different groups. So I ha again, haven't seen a lot about this here, but I imagine that the migratory species, yes, are affected and are more local protected species 
that don't travel as far probably wouldn't be as affected by the declines. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. That was really an in interesting question and a oh, beautiful photograph by Bruce Boyer, who does these great um, specializes in insect photographs that are phenomenal. So, wow, I think that's all we have this evening. Is that true, Miles? Yeah, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it and hoping we'll see some of you at other um, upcoming events. And if not, we'll see you at our next Ask a Naturalist, which I got to grab my calendar is November 19th, right before Thanksgiving. Oh, October. Let's, oh, October. gosh, see, I just went right to November. Thanks, Brett. October 22nd. Good gosh. Thank you. I'm rushing the year away. How embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, October. Um, clearly, is it Friday? It's only Thursday, right? Okay. <laughs> um, see you in October. Brett, what's the date again? 22nd. October 22nd. Yeah, send us your questions. Send us